Okay. Welcome, everyone. I am Sophronia Scott, Director of the Alma College MFA in Creative Writing, and welcome to Fiction and the MFA. This is your opportunity to not only learn more about our program, but to learn from one of our amazing faculty, S. Kirk Walsh. I'm going to share my screen and tell you a little bit about the program, about myself and about Kirk, and we will get going. Okay. You know, I realized in some of these uh, open houses that sometimes I forget to introduce myself. I am the director of the program, as I've mentioned before. I am a novelist. I'm also a nonfiction writer. I was a journalist in my previous existence as a writer for Time and People magazine in New York City. I have uh, written, let's see, my most recent novel is called Wild, Beautiful, and Free. And before that, I wrote a nonfiction book that came out in 2021, The Seeker and the Monk. It seems like I go back and forth between uh, fiction and nonfiction with my projects. But uh, since 2020, I have been working on this program. I am the founding director and was thrilled to be able to have the opportunity to build this artistic community located in the heart of Michigan. Uh, this is a photo of our most recent graduates from our Venice uh, residency. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, they're wearing those laurel wreaths because they chose to graduate in the Italian tradition and wear the uh, laurel wreaths that Italian graduates usually wear. I thought that was a, a great choice, a lot of fun. And our faculty member for this evening is S. Kirk Walsh. Her debut novel, The Elephant of Belfast, became a national bestseller and generated praise from The New Yorker, The Christian Science Monitor, and others, as well as being selected for several top reading lists. The novel has been translated for foreign editions in Norway, Iran, and Romania. Her fiction, essays, and book reviews have been published in The New York Times Book Review, The Virginia Quarterly Review, Story Quarterly, Guernica, Long Reads, Virginia Quarterly Review, San Francisco Chronicle, Los Angeles Review of Books, among others. Kirk has also worked on a number of editorial staffs of different national magazines, including Rolling Stone, The New Yorker, Self, and Entertainment Weekly. She attended the creative writing program at New York University, where she studied with E.L. Doctorow, and she has a fabulous essay about working with him. You can uh, Google that. Um, Peter Carey and Mona Simpson, and this is her website. I will hand it over to Kirk in a moment, but I will tell you a bit about the program. We are a low residency MFA, Master of Fine Arts and Creative Writing. It's a two-year program, and low residency means that it's designed to fit your schedule. You don't have to move to attend our program. You don't have to uh, leave a job. No GRE is required. There's no application fee. Low residency means that you are in residency, but only for these intensive 10 day events that happen twice a year. We have one in the winter, one in the summer. We offer three genres to study, fiction, creative nonfiction, and poetry. And during the residencies, you are paired, you get a choice. You get to submit your choice of three faculty mentors and once you're assigned a faculty mentor, you design your own program for the semester. So there are no traditional courses. Uh, your study is an independent study that you design and collaborate with your faculty mentor to design a reading list and a schedule for five monthly packets of work that you submit on deadline once a month for five months. Uh, like I said, it's, it's pretty intensive, but when you think about it, to do that once a month for five months over the course of two years, you produce a lot of work. You also participate in an, in an artistic and academic community that allows you to read and think critically as a writer. And we also encourage our students to participate in the discussion of the day. 
current events, current issues, and to know that their voices matter, that they have something to say about what's going on in the world. And the best way to participate in that discussion is to develop a strong understanding of craft, of the ability to lecture on technique, and to just understand what it is that you want to do with words, whether it be fiction, nonfiction, or poetry. Our students have a deep connection to our program. Uh, this photo was taken at the Association of Writers and Writing Programs, which is a huge uh, event for writers. It's our biggest conference. And our students want it very much for Alma to be represented at the, the most recent one, which is in Kansas City. They applied to be on a panel, which they presented about choosing an MFA. And it was just a, a wonderful experience to be there along with hundreds and hundreds of other programs, but also just to see the pride that our students had in representing the program. I also show you this image because I am asked frequently about the age range of students in the program. We have students who have recently graduated from uh, undergraduate all the way up to people who have recently retired. We have people in their 20s, we have people in their 30s, 40s, as you can see from this photo, it's a range of people. Uh, this is a photo from the uh, panel discussion led by uh, Joey Meyer. He was the moderator. And then, as I mentioned before, you have two residencies a year. And really, residency is the heart of the MFA experience. This is where we come together, students, faculty. We also have visiting writers. We have guest speakers from the publishing industry, which is unusual for an MFA program. Uh, I believe that students should understand the publishing industry and where their writing fits, whether it be with a big five publishing house, university press, small press. I believe they should understand cover design, uh, working with agents, all aspects of the publishing industry. And we usually have some aspect of that represented at each residency. For example, at our summer residency last year, we had the editor of uh, Ohio State University Press who listened to pitch sessions from the students. We also had the publisher of Pantheon, which is an imprint of Random House who came to spoke, speak to the students about the current state of the publishing industry. Our summer residencies are held on the campus of Alma College. And if you know, Michigan, if you know the mitten that is Michigan, that is right in the center of the state, about an hour north of Lansing. Our winter residencies take place in a variety of locations. We were just in Venice, Italy for our winter residency. But I will tell you that our summer 2025 residency will actually be in Oxford, England. It will be in August of 2025. Uh, we've been trying to have a residency in Oxford for quite some time. And uh, COVID rules uh, kind of put a kibosh on us doing it in the winter, but we're really excited that we're finally going to get to do it and it will be in the summer. This winter, we will be at Lake Junaluska, which is in North Carolina, not far from Asheville. We have a emphasis on place in our um, MFA, which means that we want our students to be uh, have an understanding of the ground from which they write, so to speak. And that means uh, not only just going to different places, but truly understanding the, the community, the people who write there, and what it means to be creative in different spaces. Uh, as our one of our faculty, Robert Vivian puts it, it's about understanding beautiful places, but also how do we take care of them? Uh, more photos from our Venice uh, residency. And uh, that's the, the group of us right before we, we were about to get on our private water taxis. I love this image of one of our students writing in um, San Giorgio, a cathedral in, uh, in Venice. It was truly an inspiring experience. Uh, this is a photo of us at the Scrivini Chapel where we talked about storytelling and how um, Giotto decided which frescoes, would, um, which aspect of the life of Christ would be represented in these frescoes, um, how he chose to tell that story and which images he chose to depict. And of course we had a fabulous time. The food was incredible. Uh, every meal felt like a, a, a celebration. 
But one of our students, uh, Lindy, who wrote a blog post, which you can find on our website, Lindy said that these moments, these meals meant that it wasn't like you were just going to grab a, a box lunch and go off to your room by yourself. We spent a lot of time together during these meals. Um, in Italy, meals could go on for a couple of hours. And Lindy said that when you get to know your fellow students this way, you have a different trust of them in workshop, right? You, you really understand what it is that they're saying about your work because you know them and you trust them. So th this, this became a much more special experience than, than even we anticipated. It was truly fabulous. And of course we had our usual lectures. This is Matthew Gavin Frank uh, lecturing. This was our lecture space at the Hotel Villa Franceschi. And our trips are organized by Janet Simmons of Grand Tourist. And another um, special thing about this is Janet is, um, she has her degrees in art and geography, and she is well versed in both Italy and, and she's British herself. She went to Oxford, so we will be staying at the college that she graduated from in Oxford. But um, before we would go on our excursions, she would do her own mini lectures showing us maps and talking about the places where we were going to go, their literary connections, but also their connections um, in the Italian community. She also connected us with writers in the area who came and spoke to us about their work. Again, this is another photo to talk about age range, right? <laughs> we span the age. Not everyone could go to Venice. So we had a, um, a twin residency going on in Detroit, Michigan at the same time. So these students were in Detroit going on excursions. They were with Jim Daniels, um, one of our faculty who is also from Detroit himself. Uh, they went to places like um, the Detroit Institute of Art. They toured the Ford factory and they had their own workshop uh, in Detroit. And one of our students, uh, uh, Frank on the right here, Frank graduated from Detroit. So he was zoomed into the degree ceremony. Uh, another fabulous picture of our graduates, but also uh, this was the degree ceremony and you can see Frank was able to participate via Zoom. So speaking of degree, uh, we have different degree options. You can study in one genre for four terms or two years. You can also do a mixed degree meaning that if you come, for example, to study fiction, and because you go to all of the poetry lectures, you find that you want to try your hand at poetry, you can spend a term studying poetry and still graduate in two years. Some of our students want to go full in to a second genre, and they do a dual genre degree, which means uh, they're going to be in the program for two and a half years and do six residencies. I'm sorry, six terms, five residencies. I think I have that right. But anyway, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Kirk. And when you're ready to apply, our website is alma.edu slash MFA. I will hand it over to Kirk, but I will still be here to answer questions at the end of the lesson. So thank you, Kirk. Thank you, Sophonia. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's good to be here. And yeah, I'm um, one of the more recent four faculty members at Alma. Um, I live in Austin, Texas, um, but I'm originally from Detroit. Um, so, and kind of fittingly, um, as Sophronia said, um, place is so important to storytelling, um, kind of where we set, tell our stories from. And so my exercise tonight is related to that. Um, and I kind of, so yeah, my uh, novel that was published in 2021 was set in Belfast, Northern Ireland. So my family comes from Ireland and I was kind of drawn to Ireland and kind of made my way up to the North. Um, but I was writing um, about Belfast from an outsider's point of view. Um, and what I'm gonna focus on tonight is more of like where we're from. Um, the novel I'm writing right now is set in Detroit. Um, during 
the war, um, mostly in the summer of 1943. But one of the um, many favorite writers, and I think a big part of being in a graduate program is really figuring out um, the writers that speak to you and what you want to borrow from them in terms of inspiration. And one of my favorite writers is a writer named Edward P. Jones. Um, he wrote a novel called The Known World um, about a black slave owner, um, kind of just after the Civil War. But then he's also published two um, short story collections. Uh, one's called Lost in the City and the other one's called All of Aunt A. Hager's Children. And they're both very much set in and around Washington, DC. Um, and it is reminiscent of um, the Dubliners, if you've read uh, that classic by James Joyce. And um, one thing that, uh, so Jones grew up in and around DC. He probably moved 18 times before um, he went away to college. And he said one of the reasons he was interested in studying story there was um, he found when he went to college um, that people had a very narrow idea of Washington. Um, they basically thought it was the government, the Supreme Court. Um, they didn't know that the people had lived there for generations and generations and had really almost nothing to do with the government. And so he wanted to represent um, his own experience and where he was from kind of outside of the stereotypes of DC. Um, the other, yeah, so um, I'll just show you. So um, this is his most recent collection, All Aunt Hager's Children. Um, and Lost in the City was his um, first collection. Um, there's a writer um, who I also love a lot, whose name is Jamel Brinkley, and he writes mostly um, kind of in the five boroughs of New York City, where I also lived there, um, like Sophronia. Um, I was there for about 18 years. Um, and so uh, Jamel is definitely kind of and I think this is also another kind of interesting thing about writing and reading is kind of figuring out the different kind of lineages of writers. And Jamel definitely kind of falls. Um, Edward P. Jones is someone that he really admires. Um, but Jamel, and this collection came out um, in August. And one thing he said about place was um, at least half of the story um, and witness, I started with place. And I always felt pretty, feel pretty good about that because even with the stories that don't start with place, one of the first questions I ask myself is, where are we? Because the where does so much work to pressurize the story, to shape the characters, to put the characters to scale, to reveal what the tensions are, to create the tensions quite often. For me, place is very much in the foreground of things. I don't think of it like a cardboard cutout on a stage. It's fully dimensional and the walls close in. I like the feeling in terms of producing stories. And so we often think about place as like um, the setting. But what Jamel's talking about is kind of, it's almost like a character that it can create um, and shape the characters and also kind of impact the choices they're making. Um, and so what I'm actually gonna do for the exercise. So um, I think uh, before um, we met, a handout was um, emailed to everyone of an essay that Edward P. Jones wrote. Um, and it's called Moving Pictures in Search of Summer's Past. And basically, and I would encourage you to read it um, after uh, this lesson sometime, maybe over the weekend when you have time. Um, but basically it's a nonfiction essay that um, follows the different addresses and where he lived. And I'm just gonna read um, the first paragraph and then a few other short sections. Um, so it begins, 
1525 6th Street, Northwest, 1964. I'm standing alone at the northeast corner of 6th and P Streets, a few yards down 6th Street, near the two-story building on a slight hill where I live. Boys and girls are playing. I know not one of them except my sister, an extrovert who momentarily steps away from the group to give me one last I love you look before I take off on a black three-speed bicycle my mother has bought through installments, equally more than a month's pay at a small 7th Street store that caters to the poor. In a few months in the fall, when we have moved yet again, the bike will be stolen from the hall of the decaying rooming house where we live. It will be a while before I realize the bike is gone. Um, and I'll just, there's one very short one in the middle. Um, 459 Ridge Street, Northwest, 1961. A fire, comma, which my mother believes was deliberately set by the woman who rents it, rents us a room, destroys the apartment. Um, and then the last one, 1221 Massachusetts Avenue, Northwest, 1970. We moved to this apartment a palace compared with the huts of the past so that my mother will be safe while I'm away at college. For the first time in my life, my heart is strong enough to take the move. We experience life with air conditioning. Massachusetts Avenue is where we live when my mother died. We may have moved there in the fall or it could have been the winter. I know it was not the summer. Um, so, yeah, and the thing that um, I did also include um, the first story from Lost in the City is the girl who raised pigeons. And if you um, read his essay, you'll actually see um, some parallels of uh, different streets he references and that story shows up in the essay. So it really kind of demonstrates how he's drawing from plays directly from his life. Um, so for the first part of the exercise, um, we're going to kind of follow the nonfiction part of the Jones essay. Um, and basically what I want you to do um, is make a list of three to five addresses where you've lived during different points of your life. So kind of like what he did, like just write the address and the year. Um, and then... It, it doesn't have to be chronological, but once you do like a list, um, pick three of them and write a short description um, using specific. Um, that can be from memory or you can fictionalize. Um, and once again, kind of allowing the place to really um, come alive. Um, so we will, yeah do this for about five minutes. So I'm gonna mute myself and if you just wanna do the first part of the exercise and um, I'll come back when five minutes is up. If you have any questions, um, you can unmute yourself or you can put in the chat.
okay, about another minute. So if you want to wrap up whatever you're writing. Um, so now we're going to move on to the second part of the exercise, which is more of the fiction part. So I think one of the things, um, yeah, as Ronia mentioned, I do write nonfiction and fiction um, too. And I think sometimes it can be interesting to kind of look at the interplay um, between the two forms. I know for me, um, they definitely um, inspire each other. There's kind of a cross pollination that happens sometimes. Um, so for this exercise, so everyone's um, written, you know, pick three addresses, written three descriptions. So I want you to pick one of them and um, set a scene. Uh, with two characters who are having a hard time talking to each other. Um, you know, it can be whatever circumstances um, arise for you. Um, you know, maybe one of the characters has to convey some news that's hard to share, um, bad, tragic, or difficult. Um, and maybe they never talk directly about that difficult thing, um, often with dialogue. It's usually what's left unsaid is um, carrying the tension. Um, and yeah, just trying to also use the place and the setting, um, like Jamel was talking about, sort of as a dynamic part of the scene that might either, if it's like an enclosed space, it could be outside, um, but really trying to lean on the place as a part of the scene. Um, so you'll have two characters um, who are having a hard time talking. They could um, never really mention what they might be having a difficulty with, but they can too. Um, and yeah, I would really encourage you um, just to kind of see where your hand takes you um, if you're writing longhand or if you're writing on the keyboard. Um, I think a good thing about exercises is where we to sort of free write and kind of see what happens. So um, I'll give you, you know, five or six minutes to write the scene. And once again, if you have any questions, um, you know, feel free to unmute or put them in the chat. And I will say, if you want to um, follow the Jones essay at all, it could take place during summer. So he can kind of bring more pressure to things as well. Um, and the other thing that he does in the essay is um, he writes in the present tense, which also brings a certain immediacy, um, which is something you could do if you want to kind of bring another element 
a pressure to the scene.
I'll give you another minute or so. If you want to wrap up whatever you're writing. Um. Yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I do, um, I like exercise like this in terms of, um, you know, producing new material or just kind of um, brainstorming. I, I think sometimes, yeah, just doing a little free writing kind of, kind of um, just uh, open up the windows a little <laughs> and, um, I, I think for me, like I do, um, I am more of a novelist. So um, I feel like uh, I am really drawn to place when I kind of decide what my next project is going to be. And like I said, um, you know, the novel that I published um, in 2021 was set in Belfast. And it was more out of wanting to um, a curiosity and wanting to learn more about the place where my family was from. And with Detroit, even though I grew up in the suburbs of Detroit, um, I'm learning just, uh, it's the same kind of curiosity in a way um, that I'm learning about the city. Um, you know, it's kind of showing me the shadows and light of the city um, that I didn't see it. You know, I had it like the um, memories of my childhood, but now it's sort of um, evolved into kind of this fictional landscape of my novel. Um, and I did, so one of my teachers in graduate school was a writer named Mona Simpson. And when, because it's always like, particularly with novels, it's like, how do you make the commitment? Because um, it's such a marathon. And, you know, it takes, people different likes of time. Um, for me, it tends to take me about three to five years to write a novel. Um, and that one thing that Mona said um, was pick a place you wanna spend a lot of time. <laughs> and so it does make it, um, you know, I will, I don't think ever grow tired of Detroit cause it's such a complicated, interesting city. But also, you know, I do um, feel like I wanna go back to Ireland at some point. Um, and one thing like with Jamel Brinkley and Edward P. Jones, like if you're working on short stories, place can also be a container um, for a collection. Um, there's a writer, um, some of you might know Manuel Munoz, um, he writes a lot about um, Central California uh, and his most recent story collection is called Zigzagger and most of the stories take place there. So I think like um, as you kind of, there's just certain patterns that sometimes you'll see with writers. You know, not every writer um, uses place kind of as a point of entry in the story. You know, you can use dialogue, image, 
situation. And I think a part of kind of having a chance to really explore your work in a graduate setting is um, finding what works for you. You know, what is kind of your way in to story? Um, and, you know, even though if you're writing fiction or nonfiction, like for me with fiction, um, kind of my uh, goal is to write the truth. And it's like, how do I get there? Um, and so a part of being in graduate school for me was studying a lot of different writers, having this, um, developing kind of my way of understanding literature, but then also like really applying it to my own work and deciding like what was most important to me um, and what did it mean to write the truth for me? So, um, yeah, so that's it. And yeah, like I said, I am happy to answer any questions, but um, yeah, I hope it generated some sparks of something <laughs> for you. Well done, Kirk. Thank you. Thanks. Sure. And I will uh, reiterate, does anyone have any questions, either for Kirk or myself? Okay. Well, then, so for will... you, do you want to talk a little bit about your last novel, how place figured into that for you? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, Wild, Beautiful, and Free. Uh, first of all, it's historical fiction, and it takes place in the American South at the turn of the century. So not the turn of the century, but right before the Civil War. So it starts in the 1850s and goes into the Civil War. Hmm. And it's really about this young mixed race girl getting sold into slavery and trying to find her way back home. So first place had to be established is home, right? So she came from Louisiana um, and what did this place mean to her, right? So she and her half sister used to play in the, the trees that were covered in Spanish moss, right? Um, the smells of the swamp, the, um, the, the fields um, that she would, ride through with her father. So to me, a, you know, place had to be established so that one could feel what was lost, but also what it means to come back to it. Mm -hmm. Then you then you have the place of Odyssey, right? So of all of the places that she went through in the years that she was away from home, going from Mississippi, then the train to Savannah, then going south to, I'm sorry, going north to Maryland. Um, she spends time in, in New York City as um, a student before um, ending up in Ohio, right, where she teaches. And I grew up in Ohio, so it meant mm -hmm. something for me to be able to have that in, in the book. When she gets involved in the Civil War, right, then that focused my research because it wasn't like I was going to talk about the Civil War in general. It's like, okay, which battles would she have encountered just from place where she is on the map? What happened in the Civil War in these specific areas? And so reading up on those specific battles and then letting the facts of the battle shape the story, right? And again, moving her through the story based on those battles and the movements of that particular um, regiment in the Union Army, right? Which eventually helps her get back to Louisiana. So, yeah place was, was huge for me. And I, I tend to write from place um, personally myself, just because I feel that I want the reader to be in the book with me, mm -hmm. right? To, to, to know where we're moving through space, even in a house, right? What is, um, how long is a hallway, right? Um, what does the backyard look like? Right? So it's, it means a lot. And yeah, in that particular novel, it, it was part of the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for asking. Check. I'm working on <clears throat> a a novel now based in um that takes place during World War II. And mm. I knew that the male protagonist was going to come from the South, but I did not know where. And during a visit to South Carolina uh, at the end of last year, I just happened to find out because I was in a museum, a local museum, that 
South Carolina, Charleston in particular, was a huge staging area for um, the U.S. forces during World War II. So it's like, oh, I, I didn't know that. Okay, so he's going to be from <laughs> South Carolina, right? So, but sometimes, uh, you know, history helps. <laughs> you know, yeah. lends a hand. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I had a quick question about the uh, historical fiction follow-up there. Sophronia, yes, um, no. did you do a lot of research before you started to go into the story or did the story lead you to a lot of research on before and during the Civil War? <clears throat> you know, actually, it's interesting you asked me that because what I learned about research and story, I learned, and I think I told you this before, Kirk, I learned from Edward P. Jones. Mm -hmm. Because I was in New York City when he was there for a reading at the Barnes and Noble on the Upper West Side. And we were at the I, same reading. Oh, oh my God. God. That is scary. <laughs> I feel like, first, I really do feel like we were we following have each other around the city. Yes, we were. We, I think we knew a lot of the same people or similar people. But yeah, I, I was at that reading and I asked I, I, him about his research. Right? I have that. I have it too. Um, I asked him about his research and he talked about all of the research he did for that book. But then he said that only a, like a quarter of that research ended up in the book because at the end of the day, he realized that he was not writing about how the latch on a slave quarters worked. He was writing a story about people. And so that, that led me to, to think, okay, story first, right? Who are these people? Um, what is the story that I'm going to tell? and then figuring out what research I needed to tell their story. So for example, I didn't do the Civil War uh, research until I realized where she was going to be, at what point she was leaving the home where she was, and then figuring out which battles would I need to fit in with where she was in the story. And even then, it's, it's not like I need to know every single thing about the battle. I was looking for specific details where I could see he could play a role, so to speak, right? So um, I ended up um, using the Battle of Shiloh and you know, reading some amazing accounts of what that battlefield looked like at the you know, end of the day and the nurses going through the fields at night looking to find anyone alive that they could possibly treat, right? So my character becomes a, a nurse in the Civil War. So to me, that was a poignant scene. And and I and moving, it's like okay, yeah, I'm gonna put that scene in my book. So the history yeah. helped to, to shape the story, yeah. And I think one thing um, to keep in mind with historical fiction, like um, diaries, letters, and firsthand accounts, are really a great source of material in terms of hearing the voices and kind of like one thing that Edward P. Jones said was like you need enough information in. And this is true from the contemporary and um, historical fiction of um, in being able to describe a character moving through the world, whether it's in a room or outside. And that's, um, yeah, like what Sophronia said, like it's relational that ultimately it's like we're trying to tell a story about humanity. So in yeah. order to do that, we have to show the characters um, in relationship to each other. And I think sometimes um, research can be a little bit of a rabbit hole and we yes. can get yeah. a little lost in it. But um, I always try to write and research at the same time. I never try, like I never let the research get in the way of the writing. That's kind of my yes. one thing. So. Yeah, I agree. And I also think that that some writers try to stick too closely to the the research. Right. And, and it kind of leaves the story flat. So, for example, uh, I was when working on this current novel, I was just moved by um, this account that I read of a soldier talking about the things that he had seen during the war. And even though he was writing letters all the time to his girl back home, he knew that there were specific things that, that he did not tell her. And in, in fact, there was a letter that he had written where he did pour all of this out to her, but then he decided not to send it. And so to me, I'm like, whoa, what happened if a soldier did send that kind of letter? What would happen to the relationship? What would happen if she didn't get it? Like, like all of these different things. 
right? So, so that piece of history got me started, but the, the what ifs are, are what lead you down the, the tail, the, um, the, the area that makes it become a story. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, you're welcome, Bill. Thanks for asking. Anything else? Okay. Well, if you have questions for me that you felt that, that you didn't want to ask in a, a public forum, next week is my next set of individual sessions, uh, Thursday the 28th. And on our website, you can go and sign up for your own private Zoom session with me. They are 20 minute sessions. So I am available if you would like to speak more about the program. I'm Sophronia Scott, she's Kirk Walsh. We are with the Alma College of MFA in Creative Writing. Thank you for being here with us this evening. Have a good evening and good luck with your writing. Bye everybody. Yeah, good writing. <laughs>